Welcome back to Heroes of the Faith, a show where we are inspired by the lives of the saints so that we can become saints ourselves. I am your host, Isaac Longworth, and uh, this one time I was in Detroit, Michigan, going to Sunday Mass. And as I walked into the church, I noticed that there was something different happening that day. There was some kind of a celebration because a lot of the people in the pews were wearing this uniform that I had never seen before. They were wearing these hats and sashes and, and capes on their backs, and I didn't know who they were representing. And so after Mass, I began to talk with some of them, and I learned that they were called the Knights of St. Peter Claver. Now, another fact is that every single one of the men there was African American. And in talking with them, I learned that the reason that the Knights of St. Peter Claver were formed is because at certain points in American history, black people were not allowed to join many of the local Catholic associations. And so because they weren't allowed to join their associations, they decided to make their own. They made this group called the Knights of St. Peter Claver, and they dedicated it to one of their heroes, this man named St. Peter Claver. Well, I wondered about who this St. Peter was. What did he do? What was it about this man that inspired these black Catholics to choose him as their patron in fighting racism? Well, that's what we're going to learn about today in today's show, St. Peter Claver. Now, Peter was born in the year 1580. He was born to a wealthy farming family in Spain. Now, his family growing up were very devout Catholics, and so from the time that he was a little child, Peter was taught to love the Lord. He had a very good family growing up. As a teenager, he went to the University of Barcelona. He was a very bright young man. While he was still in school, he felt this prompting to become a priest. He felt the Lord putting this call on his life to follow him as one of his priests. And so, after getting his degree from the University of Barcelona, he joined the Jesuits, the Society of Jesus, at the age of 20. And so he began to study for the priesthood as a seminarian. Well, while he was studying for the priesthood, he got to know a man named Alphonsus Rodriguez, who's also a saint. Maybe we'll do a little show on him later. Who knows? But Alphonsus was the doorkeeper at the university. Now, Alphonsus had a gift of prophecy. He was able to hear what God was saying to people. And he told this young seminarian, he told Peter that the Lord had chosen him for a very specific mission, that God had called Peter, not just to be a priest, but to go and serve in the colonies of New Spain. New Spain was uh, parts of South and North America where the Spanish had gone to colonize those areas and call them New Spain. And so Peter heard this call from the Lord through this prophet Alphonsus to go there and serve the people. And so Alphonsus urged Peter to say yes to God in advance, to say yes to his plan to go to these colonies. And so seeking to follow God's will, Peter volunteered to do some of his seminary training in the new kingdom of Granada. So the Spanish had conquered and colonized the regions of Panama and Colombia, kind of that central uh, America, Northern South America region. And so that is where Peter volunteered to go and spend some of his time training to become a priest. When he landed in these colonies, Peter was appalled by an evil that was being done there by the Spanish conquerors. He was appalled by what his countrymen were doing to the local people. You see, the Native Americans of Colombia, of Panama, had been subjugated by their new Spanish overlords. Their land had been stolen. Their resources were being plundered to be sent back to the rich and wealthy in Spain. And these Native Americans were being treated as second-class citizens at best. Very often, they were treated much worse. They were enslaved, forced to work for their new masters, treated as something subhuman. But he was also horrified by the African slave trade that was taking place. The slave trade that was bringing nearly 10,000 slaves through their ports every year. And this is what was happening. The Spanish, when they had come to this new world, this part of South America, they had seized the rich silver and gold mines that were located there. But since the Spanish didn't want to do the brutal labor in the mines themselves, they wanted to have some slave workers to mine the gold and silver for them. 
but they found that the natives who lived there were too weak for the work to do it. They died much too early on from disease, from the abuse that they suffered for them to be able to get much use out of them. And so they decided to import Africans who were much stronger, much hardier, were viewed as better slaves, and they were to be sent to the mines to get gold and silver for the Spanish. Now, the slave trade, if you don't know too much about the African slave trade, it was a truly appalling practice. Uh, what would happen is Africans would be kidnapped from their home country. They would be packed tightly onto slave ships. They would be crammed in so that there would be hardly room for them to breathe. And then they would be shipped for this long journey across the Atlantic. Now, this trip across the Atlantic was a brutal trip. Nearly a third of the Africans would die along the way from mistreatment, from abuse, from diseases, from starvation. Um, sometimes if they were sick, they would be thrown overboard to drown because they were considered cargo. They weren't even considered human beings. Finally, when they would reach the port in uh, the kingdom of New Granada, they would be taken off the ships, brought to shore, and they would be corralled like animals in pens or cages. And then they would finally be sold to the highest bidder for a price. And this selling was a brutal time as well. They would be looked at as if they were animals. Families would be separated, so they would sell a husband to one farm and a wife to another farm. Children would be taken away from their parents. Um, often the masters would brand their slaves. They would burn their mark into their skin to show ownership. It was, it was just horrible. These Africans were being treated as animals, as property, not as human beings with any kind of dignity. And so when Peter showed up, into the colonies and saw this practice taking place, he was sickened by the abuse that he saw. It turned his stomach to see image bearers of God, these human beings, being treated like property. And it was being done by quote-unquote Christians. The Spanish were all Catholic, and despite the fact that the popes had denounced slavery many times as a terribly evil sin, the popes had called for an end to the slave trade, many Spanish Christians in the colonies simply ignored church teaching because they wanted to benefit from the slaves. They didn't want to work their own land. They wanted to just kidnap these people and use them. They wanted to use them for labor. And so they ignored what the church taught about slavery and continued to do this wicked and evil thing. Now, Peter's seminary formation at this time was taken over by a saintly man named Father Alonso de Sandoval. Now, Father Alonso, he was an amazing priest. He had spent nearly 40 years fighting the slave trade there in the colonies. He had advocated for more justice for the Africans. He had cared for them after they had been shipped to the colonies. He ministered to them, healed them of their wounds, fed them, and brought them Jesus. And so Peter learned so much from this new mentor about how to minister to the slaves. And he was eager, as soon as he was a priest, to take up this work, to follow in Father Alonzo's footsteps and to be a slave to these slaves. His heart burned with love for these poor people who had been so cruelly treated by his fellow Spanish countrymen. And so when it was time for Peter to make his final promises he signed his name officially with the title Peter, Slave of the Africans Forever. And with this title, he was committing his life as a priest to serve the slaves in their physical and spiritual needs to act as their slave in order to reach them with God's love. He had committed his life to this. And so as soon as he was a priest, he got right to work. He didn't waste any time. He would go down to the shore when he knew that a slave ship had come and was anchored in the port. He would go down to the shore and would wait for them. And it was a chaotic scene. The Africans would be herded off of the boats. There would be whips cracking. They would be confused and afraid. They had no idea what they were getting themselves into. They had no idea what was awaiting them on the shore. Many of them didn't speak any Spanish at all, so they had no idea what was happening to them. And once they got on shore, they would be put into these pens like animals, and they could be held there for several days before being sold. And so Father Peter would meet them on the shore. He brought with him a team of African translators who could speak many of the African dialects and languages, and he would go to the shore with this team, and he would give the slaves medicine and water and food, 
and he would give them lemons because after this long trip over the Atlantic, many of them would, would be starved for vitamins. And so he would give them these lemons, these high uh, vitamin fruit in order to nurse them back to health. He would help them however he could, physically speaking. He would explain to them what their situation was. He would explain to them what slavery was, what was going to happen to them, uh, try and comfort them as much as he could. Sometimes if he had time and he was able to, he would go out on a boat to meet them on the slave ship and he would go down into the dark hold underneath the ship where they were stored, where they were still packed in chains to minister them in the hold of the ship, to bring them water, to try and nurse them back to health, to comfort those who were sick and dying. If a slave who was sick was cast overboard or left on the beach to die, the masters thought they wasn't worth uh, that much money, wouldn't bring them in a profit and just left them to die. Father Peter would go and find them on the shore, pick him her or her up and bring them to safety, would nurse them back to health, would minister to them, give them the medicine that they needed. And many of these slaves who he had rescued would then join his team to help him on his outreaches on the beach. Now, as he kept doing this over and over again, the slaves came to trust him. They saw that this strange priest, this strange Spaniard really did care for them because he did everything he could to protect and help them, even when the masters tried to stop him from doing so. When the slaves were being held in their pens in the port, Father Peter would go with his team of translators and tell them about Jesus. Now, many of these slaves had never heard of the name of Jesus before. Most of them would have come from Africa, where they would have believed in their pagan tribal religions. They would have worshipped many different gods. But he came and told them about the one true God. And he told them that all men, whether they're black, whether they're white, all men are made in God's image, this one God's image, and that this God loves them, that he wanted to be in heaven with us forever. That we as human beings, that we're not made for this world with its pain, with its suffering, but we are made for heaven. We are made for God. He loves us. And that is our goal. Our hope is not in this world. It's not in the pleasures and the joys that this world has to offer. Our hope as men is in God, living with him forever in heaven. And he told them that the way to heaven is through Jesus, the son of God who came to earth and died for our sins so that we could be forgiven if we turn away from them, if we turn away from our wrongdoings, if we put our faith in the Lord Jesus and are baptized into his church, we can attain this goal of heaven. And because many of them didn't speak Spanish and the, the language barrier was real, he would use pictures to teach them. He had crucifixes that he would give out. He would do this to get his point across. He would pass out rosaries and medals to them. He used a lot of tactile methods of teaching in order to share Jesus with these Africans. Now, amazingly, many of the Africans actually listened to his preaching, which when I heard about this, I was amazed. Think about it from their perspective. Every single Spanish person that they had met was cruel had kidnapped them from their homes, ripped them away from their country, from their families, had sold them, beaten them, abused them, tortured them. Every single Christian that they'd met was cruel. But Father Peter was different. And he was able to break through all of that mistrust, all of that resentment, to share with them the message of Jesus. And they were touched. They were touched by the love of God that they saw coming to them from Father Peter. His message brought them hope that despite their sufferings here on earth, God loved them. I mean, Father Peter knew that their life in the colonies would not be easy. He didn't, he didn't pretend that it was going to be a simple life as a slave. It was going to be a hard and brutal life. But he gave them hope that when the sufferings of this life were done, they could spend an eternity with God, joyfully living with him as saints forever. And so his message brought them hope and it restored the dignity that they deserved as human beings, as image bearers of God. Now, Father Peter, he never forced them to convert. I mean, if you think about it, that would have never worked anyways. He had to do it out of love. He had to do it by building trust with them. He served all of the Africans, whether they converted or not. It wasn't like he would only give food to the Christians or medicine to the Christians. He genuinely loved all of them. He wanted to serve them in their physical 
and their spiritual needs. And as a result of this, many of them came to Jesus. Now, in addition to all of this genuine Christian charity that he was showing, he also backed up the truth of the gospel that he was preaching with miraculous signs and wonders. He became famous among the slaves for healing the sick, even raising the dead by praying with them. And he showed them the power of the God that he was telling them about. And they trusted him. His love for them was so genuine, they wanted to worship the God that he worshipped. And so thousands upon thousands of Africans, even in the midst of their hardships, in the midst of their slavery, were finding the light of Jesus. They were becoming Christians through his work, his ministry to them. It's estimated, historians estimate that he baptized around 300,000 African slaves through his time of ministry. 300,000 people rescued from the kingdom of darkness, rescued from the powers of hell and brought into the kingdom of the Lord Jesus, brought into fellowship with our heavenly father, became Christians through his ministry. What a wonderful harvest of souls for the Lord through St. Peter Claver's ministry. And in baptizing them, he restored their dignity that had been taken away from them by the cruelty of their slave masters. Many of them would weep for joy after becoming Christians because they now knew that no matter what life threw at them, they were confident that they could spend eternity in heaven with their heavenly father who loved them and who had created them. This is what St. Peter Claver was doing. And during the months when the slaves were not coming into port, Father Peter would take time to travel to all of the plantations, all of the mines where the slaves had been sold after landing on the beach. And when he arrived there, he continued to evangelize. He would celebrate the sacraments for them there. He would baptize their babies. He would hear mass for them. He would hear their confessions. It was just this wonderful ministry to the slaves. And even though he was Spanish, when he arrived at homes, he would refuse to stay in the house with the Spanish masters. No matter how much they tried to get him to come and stay inside the house, he would only sleep in the slave quarters outside, which if you can imagine would be very uncomfortable for the masters of the house. But by doing so, he proved a strong point that all of us are human beings and that no one should receive special treatment. Now, Father Peter's work amongst the slaves, as you can imagine, it made him a lot of enemies in the city. The slave traders hated Father Peter. They hated him because he preached so forcefully again and again in his homilies against the evils of slavery. And that was bad for their business. People were being converted. It was bad for business and it pricked their consciences. They knew what they were doing was wrong. They knew it was wrong to treat humans in this way, to abuse them, to torture them. And Father Peter did not let their consciences rest, but continued to exhort them to turn away from this evil sin, to repent and to come back to the Lord before it was too late. Some Catholics were very scandalized that Father Peter was giving sacraments to the Africans. Remember, they considered the Africans not to be human. They didn't consider them to have souls. They viewed them as animals. And so when they saw him there baptizing them and giving communion to them, they were appalled that he would do this to things that they viewed as subhuman. And so many of them stopped going to his church to protest his methods. And Father Peter didn't care. If you were going to leave the church because he was baptizing Africans, he didn't really want you in church anyways. So they left in protest and Father Peter just kept on doing what he was doing. Some of the city magistrates who had made a lot of money off of the slave trade, they tried to get Father Peter in trouble with his superiors. They tried to get him into trouble because they hated this meddlesome priest who exhorted the slavers in the city to repent of their sins, to turn back to God before it was too late, to repent of their racism. And so they did not like him. They tried to get him in trouble, but Father Peter, he didn't care. He knew from scripture that God shows no partiality, but that in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. And Father Peter lived that with his life. He knew that human beings are created in God's image and each one of them has an immortal soul. He knew that every human is loved by God, that God desires them to be saved and to live with him forever in heaven. It doesn't matter what color of skin they have, all are equal before God. 
And so for 40 years, he served as a slave to the slaves until one day he contracted a deathly illness that left him in pain and almost paralyzed for four years. And so he was incapable of caring for himself. He was really sick. And his Jesuit brothers hired uh, an ex-slave, a freed slave, to come and care for him in his illness. But the problem was is that this ex-slave was a selfish man. He was an, un- he was an unkind man. And he abused and mistreated this sick priest. He would even steal the majority of his food. And yet through it all, Father Peter never complained once. He accepted it all. He offered up all of his sufferings of his illness, of his abuse by his caretaker. He suffered all of it for the African slaves who he was unable to tend to in his illness. He mourned the fact that he was too weak to take care of them anymore, but he offered up his sufferings for their sake until eventually he died. Now, St. Peter Claver is an amazing saint. I, I realized right away why he had been chosen as the patron of fighting systemic racism in the church, because he worked to break patterns of racism that existed in his society and had even spread amongst Christians. Even though the church had always denounced slavery as a sin, had always said that it was a horrible crime against God and against man, many Catholics refused to obey. They refused to obey God's law and instead they chose to view fellow human beings as property, as subhuman, as animals that they could use to satisfy their own greed. But Peter fought against it. He knew that in God's eyes, we are all equal before him. We are loved as as his children, no matter what tribe, no matter what race or ethnicity we belong to. And so I think that we need to imitate St. Peter to become saints like he was. We need to fight against any kind of hatred, any kind of bigotry that is based on the color of someone's skin, especially, especially if we see it happening within the church. Now, as you know, as I know, racism definitely exists in our world today. There are still people who view others as less than them because of their ethnicity, because of their color. Even though, praise God, slavery has been abolished, these sentiments of racism have never gone away. But as Christians, we know that racism does not have a place in our life. It's just simply unacceptable. God loves all people. And so as Christians, we are called to be channels of that love to everyone, regardless of the color of their skin, recognizing that we are all brothers and sisters of the same Heavenly Father. The same God created us all in his image. And the Catholic Church is universal. It spreads all over the globe, full of people from every race, every tribe coming to worship Jesus together as one. And really, the Catholic Church is an earthly image of what heaven will look like. Heaven is full of people of every color, every tribe worshiping Jesus. And the church is a sign to our divided world of what the love of God can do to unite people together. And so let's pray to St. Peter Claver for all of the graces that he can seek from God for us to make this world into a place where hatred and racism are no more. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord God, we come before you and we we pray for all the places in the world where hatred and racism are rampant where people are treated as less than others, as inferior because of the color of their skin. Lord, we repent of any times that we ourselves participated in racism of any kind. Help us through the intercession of St. Peter Claver to recognize that we are all equals, that we are part of the same human family, that we are children of God. St. Peter Claver, you, you worked with those whose society viewed as non-human. You were willing to identify with them, to live among them, to choose them over the rich and the elite. Help us to imitate you, to advocate for those who the world despises, those who the world casts away, that like you, we may recognize in them image bearers of God who Jesus died to save, that every single human being, no matter their color, 
no matter their tribe, is a precious child of God who Jesus came to die on the cross for. And St. Peter Claver, you constantly preached this Jesus to people. You constantly invited them to put their faith in the Lord in order to become saints forever with him in heaven. Help us to imitate you in your zeal to evangelize. Let us never tire of proclaiming the gospel to our friends, to our family, to the whole world, so that many souls will come to know Jesus as the king of their life. St. Peter Claver, slave of the slaves, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.